Mm -hmm. drunk. Hello, it's been a while since I've made an arcade compilation video. I would gotten used to just spending 4 or 5 minutes on each arcade game individually, but with this group of games, I think they all fit the motif that they should have been ported to the Super Nintendo so more people knew about them. Although, okay, there's one exception I'll get to in a bit. I know most of the time when I'm talking about arcade games that never made it to Super Nintendo, I am stretching the possibility a wee bit much with some games, but this group, I think it would have fit pretty well. But first I gotta get to the exception I mentioned. One of my first thoughts for a game that I haven't covered yet was Captain America and the Avengers, a beat-em-up developed by Data East. But wait a minute, that game did get a port, only it was freaking terrible! It was brought over by Mindscape of all companies, but I'm willing to bet if Data East had the time and money to bring over a proper port of this arcade game, it would have been quality. I appreciate how this game is just a little different than the usual beat-em-ups we saw at the time. I like the smaller, quicker sprites, and the hit detection here is still well done, with the AI giving you opportunities to use your character's speed to get out of bad situations. Meanwhile, the Super Nintendo port was dreadfully slow, with terrible hit detection and cheap damage loops where you'd lose lives left and right. Had this game been properly ported, we could have had faster paced action, lots of stuff to throw at enemies, more special moves, and no, I'm not naive enough to think that 4-player could have worked on the SNES. Yes, but I mean, come on, a Data East port almost certainly would have been better than what we ended up getting. At the very least, the Genesis game is decent, but a proper arcade port could have topped it. Let's move over to Konami and Vendetta, a traditional beat-em-up made in 1991 that never got any kind of home console release. And to be honest, there's really not that much unique about this one, but it's still a lot of fun because it's such a product of its time. We got cool dudes in sunglasses with t-shirts tucked into their jeans. We got bad guys with hair like they belong in a white snake cover band. We got big fat dudes in luchador masks. You can whip guys in the nuts with a chain. You got this cheap Las Vegas version of Master Blaster, only they're wearing purple velvet suits. You got cutscenes in the middle of levels with pixel art like this. Such a good time. I really like how you can make a guy go splat in the background, kind of like in Batman Returns. But in addition to that, you can also throw them into the foreground, like tossing these dudes into the water right at the beginning here. Also, what is with these guys? Why are they walking around like the Titans in Attack on Titan? I guess they really need to pee or something. Here, let me help you out with that. Vendetta's not as crazy and frenetically paced as some of the other beat-em-ups of its time, but it's still definitely worth playing if you missed out on it. Ninja Kids is a Taito beat-em-up made in 1990, and this game is just laugh-out-loud funny. It may not look like much, but it's pretty dang fun to play. There's four playable characters to choose from, each with their own weapon, and each capable of all sorts of cool ninja moves and stuff. And oh no, the servants of THE Satan? What, as opposed to Miroslav Satan? But yeah, you just go around slicing people in half. There's no blood or anything, but there's plenty of hilarious cartoon violence. This game has tons of personality, even the regular run-of-the-mill bad guys look interesting, and there's all sorts of mini-bosses like this overinflated Inspector Gadget, or this dude that gets turned into a werewolf. You got these guys poking their heads out of windows as you try and climb, while picture frames, globes, and computer chips fly at you. Then you fight these guys who are somehow missing their elbows, and the game just goes on from there. It's a good time. Here's a game I had no idea even existed. It's Ring of Destruction Slam Masters 2, the sequel to Saturday Night Slam Masters, and it's just what a proper sequel should be. It's bigger and faster, with more wrestlers to choose from, more moves to execute, and it keeps what worked in the first game, like being able to play as Hagar from Final Fight. There's a combo system here, in addition to some other massive moves you can pull off, like the classic spinning pile driver, and the sprite work and backgrounds here represent some of Capcom's best work in the 90s. Some people may have missed this one, since the title is a bit misleading. I mean, when most people hear about a ring of destruction, they're usually making some kind of Taco Bell joke. But yeah, this one is well worth checking out, especially if you dig the first game. It's always satisfying to be able to destroy people with Mayor Mike Hagar and fight dudes with names like Biff Slamkowicz. What is that, Polish? I've talked about Darkseal in a past video since I covered its sequel, Darkseal 2, also known as Wizardfire, which is a fun sword and sorcery hack and slash playthrough, but its predecessor isn't one to be overlooked either. Darkseal, is also known as Gate of Doom, is a bit more simple and stripped down, as you might expect, and there's four playable characters, all with different weapons and spells you can use, including a ninja, you know, because all fantasy settings need a ninja, I guess, and a spell turns him into a pig? Okay, sure. To be honest, there's really not much much to this game, it's just a big bag of crazy, which is a-okay with me, and if you like this game, then you'll definitely enjoy the sequel, Wizardfire, as well. 
Rogat Armor Force is kind of a run and gun shoot 'em up hybrid made in 1992 by Data East. You roll on the ground, so there is some platforming here and there, but for the most part, you're shooting up at everything in the sky around you. What makes this one really stand out is that it has a similar structure to Gradius, where before each game, you get a choice of what type of projectile, what kind of melee weapon, and what special ability you want your vehicle to have. And that gives this game a metric ton of replay value since you can try out all sorts of combinations. Of course, it helps that this game game looks and sounds awesome too, just some good old make stuff go boom action all over the place, and the game is made by Data East, so it's got some real polish to it. Definitely check this one out. If you prefer regular old arcade shoot 'em ups then there's Zexus... Sex sex zig sex yeah, yeah, that's close enough. This one was made in 1991 by Konami, and it plays like their answer to our type, since your ship is equipped with a detachable pod that you can use to fire either ahead or behind you to take out enemies and projectiles, with the main difference here being that this pod has weird tentacle things that act on their own. This is a really fun playthrough that's got some seriously weird settings, like, what am I in Crunchberry land here? And here you're inside some creature blowing apart walls of mucus, complete with a disgusting sound effect effect of it stretching apart. This one's got some truly impressive graphics for the time, and if you're into horizontal shoot-em-ups, it's well worth a playthrough. Of course, no 80s or 90s arcade game list would be complete without one very important component, dinosaurs. So naturally, we have a game here titled Prehistoric Isle 2, made by dev teams named Saurus and Yumekobo in 1999. And yup, what you see here is what you get. You fly in a helicopter and you blow up dinosaurs as they rip apart this city in the background here. Some of the background effects, like this building completely collapsing here, are really well done. And if you dig shoot 'em ups like this that have a bit more of a challenge, you'll like this one because it's really freaking and tough with some absurd boss fights. Plus you gotta rescue bystanders sitting there on the ground as they hang on for dear life as you fly around. Or in some cases you gotta protect them as they make their way to a rescue copter, which is kind of a neat touch. There's also a game called Hot Dog Storm. It's a vertical shoot 'em up made by Marble in 1996, and uh, to be honest, I just wanted to point out that there is a game out there called Hot Dog Storm. It makes no attempt to explain the title whatsoever. It's just hot dog storm. That's all. So, yeah. If you'd rather play a more simple Contra style run and gun, then there's Beirut. Get it? Beirut, only it's not Beirut like the city, it's a it's a root of bays, I guess, I don't know. But still, this is a solid Contra clone in, that's made in tandem between Sega and Sunsoft in 1989. You can flip between four different weapons that can each be upgraded at least once, and you gotta love a good Contra clone that has a huge flamethrower like this, it makes you overpowered as hell. Well, at least until some stray, slow-moving bullet sneaks into the screen and kills you, like what always happens in these games. But still, this is a fun and simple game that's good for a quick playthrough. Finest Hour is another interesting run and gun game, this one made by Namco in 1989, and you might recognize this one since it was briefly available on the Wii Virtual Console back in the day. You play as a mech that can hover and dash while destroying everything that moves with the handy targeting system that you see on screen here. And what's weird is that there's no life meter, only a temperature gauge that goes up when you absorb damage and when you use your hover or dash mechanics, and it goes back down when you're at rest. So there's a bit of management involved here, which is kind of neat. Sadly, this game only has four levels, and the game makes you play through them twice, but still it's kind of a fun one to pick up and play. Next we have First Funky Fighter, and what in the hell is this game? What do we got here, like a first person whack-a-mole using your own fists? That's right, you're tearing apart sharks and crocodiles with your bare fists, occasionally getting a machete and going to town on some other deadly animals. I mean, I don't even need to say anything else here. I mean, just look how freaking crazy this game is. It's laugh out loud stupid funny, and while it may not be a very long game, it's definitely worth a look if your day needs a good pick-me-up. Nothing like punching a shark in the mouth to help you feel better. Let's go way back to 1982 with Super Pac-Man. Yup, that's right, game companies were naming stuff Super way before even the Super Nintendo. Now, of course everyone knows all about the immediate Pac-Man stuff that followed the success of the original, like Miss Pac-Man, Junior Pac-Man, Baby Pac-Man, Pac-Man Plus, even the strange Pac-Land that turned Pac-Man into a side-scrolling platformer. But Super Pac-Man is one that I personally missed, so I had to point it out here. Instead of eating dots, you're eating keys to open doors, with the goal being to snatch up all the food on the map so you can move on. The power pellets turn Pac-Man into Super Pac-Man, which more than doubles his size, which is pretty cool. This game is available as part of the Pac-Man Museum collection, along with a bunch of other stuff, and it's a good spin on an old classic. 
Finally, this wouldn't be a proper arcade compilation video without some weird-ass made-up sport from Data East. Here we've got Heavy Smash, made in 1993, the players look like American Gladiators started a football team, and the game itself is pretty much just full-contact basketball but soccer somehow on a big, futuristic-looking court where you shoot the ball into a soccer net, which isn't really a net. While this isn't as immediate or as fun as something like Windjammers, it's still pretty good with a second player, and it's worth a look if you're into bizarre made up sports games like this. Whew, okay, that's all for now. I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.